Welcome to Life Transformation Radio. This show is all about life transformations and our journey from where we were to why we are doing what we are doing today. We will discuss the hiccups, the roller coasters, and the blood, sweat, and tears that has been poured out while discovering our purpose. It is all about our transformation. Here is your host, Sean Douglas. Good and good evening to another episode of Transformation Radio. I'm your host, Master Resilience Implementer, TEDx Speaker, Business Positioning Strategist, Air Force Veteran, and Author, Sean Douglas. This show is currently heard in over 70 countries. So if it's your first time joining or you've been listening to us sometime, I want to thank you for those who are listening to Life Transformation Radio is our transformation. Here is where we tell the story of why we're doing what we're doing, highlight that transformation moment that changed our lives, and how we use this to transform others and elevate their lives as well. You can listen to us live right here on the Real Talk Radio Network at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. Radio community. I ask that you subscribe to Life Transformation Radio wherever you're comfortable listening to podcasts. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spreaker, Spotify, TuneIn, Player FM, Radio Public, Overcast, Castbox, and the Google Play Music app. Wherever you listen to podcasts, please subscribe. Life Radio. On the show, my guests are entrepreneurs, speakers, business coaches, podcasters, authors, basically amazing people who are impacting the world around them. And my guest today does exactly that. If you have any questions for any of the guests that I bring on the show during the live broadcast, call us at 757-383-1109. Again, the number is 757-383-1109. If you have a question for my guests or a question for myself, we're talking on this show, please give us and be part of the program. And with that, please help me welcome to the show, my guest for today, Mark. Welcome to Life Transformation Radio. Sean, thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be on the show. I love the uh, the tag mentality here. Uh, we tagged you first, brought you on getting to hired, and now I'm on your show. Thank you so much for having me. Dude, your show is absolutely amazing. So before we begin, tell everybody what your show is about. And where you can find it. So I produce a video series called Getting to Hired, Getting the Number Two and Hired. And you can find that not only on LinkedIn, but on YouTube at Getting to Hired. And that show is all about helping military members and veterans in their military transition from their military life into a successful civilian career. And I do that not only by documenting my own experience as a military veteran, but also interviewing subject matter experts and uh, veterans who are going through transition uh, and successful, uh, successfully gone through transition to be able to share their life lessons, their lessons learned, uh, and to be able to set up those veterans and military members for success in their civilian life. I love it. Absolutely amazing. So the title of this episode is Transitioning from the Military, Tony Morrow. After over a decade as a naval officer in the Royal Canadian Navy, Tony Morrow now works to help military members and veterans in their military transition. Through the video series, Getting to Hired, the number two, Getting to Hired, Tony works to help veterans transition from their military career to a successful civilian one. By sharing his own experience, lessons learned, mistakes, and successes, he shares examples and inspiration to set up veterans for success in their civilian life. Service stakeholders through tenacity, energy, and drive. Find Tony on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, right there in the show notes. You can go ahead and copy those or do a search, copying and pasting into that particular platform and connect with him. Connect with him on Life Transformation Radio. And Tony, my first question for you, man, is why? Why did you choose this? And what is your DIY for what you do? Well, um, I'll go a little backwards there. So what's the deep why as to uh, you know, what it is that I do? And, and really in the fundamental uh, answer to that question is my family. Um, I, 
I, I'm a military veteran uh, based on the fact that um, uh, just about 10 years into my career, I was injured. And due to the injury, was uh, medically released or had to medically retire from the Royal Canadian Navy. And um, as anyone who's in the in the service um, can relate, uh, and especially was the case with me, I had a lot tied up with my military identity. My sense of self was tied into my uniform. My sense of purpose and and direction in life was all about you know what I was going to do in the Navy. And um, there were some casualties or, you know, some, some prices to pay in that regard. And one of them was, was my family. When I got injured, um, um, the injury, well, so I was, I was injured in a diving accident um, before I released. And it took a while for the, uh, the kind of like the symptoms of that injury to manifest. Um, acutely, you know, physically they treat you and, and you get better and you're fine but I ended up dealing with some mental trauma or an operational stress injury surrounding that incident. And I developed a set of symptoms um, that made me a very difficult person to be around and uh, you know, suffering through that operational stress injury or PTSD and getting treatment to get through the other side of that um, to be a functional member of society. Again, my family was rock solid with me. And help me through that. And that was not an easy process. I, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of counseling, a lot of speaking to specialists, a lot of um, treatment that I went through to be able to be successful on the other side of that. Um, but the, the drive, the tenacity and the energy that was put into that was all about the love and the passion I have for my family. And I was not willing to give that up. They are the most important thing in my life. And if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have been able to get through that experience at all. So w- what is my why? Wow. They are my why. Wow. Man, that's, that's incredible, man. We always talk about the families that are left behind. When we deploy and we do you know, the things that we do, I think who's taking care of the families? You know, the families mm-hmm. are the ones that are sacrificing just as much as we are. And I feel like there's a lot of out there that maybe people don't know. Uh, there's a lot of programs out there that are offered that maybe you just decide not to take advantage of. Um, so talk to us about about a moment, whether it's the it's the moment that you transitioned or or whatever you choose. What is the transformational moment? That pivotal moment that put you on the path to what you're currently doing today. Hmm. Well, so I'll put that, I'll, I'll break that into two things. One is the message and the, the veteran advocacy that I'm doing now. And the second piece and the first, the piece I'll start with is the kind of the social media piece in the Royal Canadian Navy. Uh, during my service, the use of social media was strongly discouraged. Facebook, Twitter, what have you. Uh, don't go on it. Don't advertise about who it is, what you do, and all that business. Professionally, stay off of social media. And uh, there are understandable reasons for that. I mean, there's op- OPSEC reasons uh, and so on. Um, but nonetheless, you know, social media was not necessarily a place where uh, I spent a lot of time or had a lot of uh, ex- experience. When I, was, uh, when I realized that I was going to be medically released from the Canadian Armed Forces, I explored i was really into podcasts at the time i was listening to uh john lee dumas entrepreneur on fire the smart passive income podcast with pat flynn and and there's a bunch of cbc radio or canadian broadcasting corporation radio programs that are on podcasts as well my favorite was a science one called quirks and quirks and um and i really enjoyed those podcasts and i thought it would be great to um maybe do something like that i had just become a new dad and I was struggling as a father. I, I didn't feel that I had the skill set to be successful in that, in that endeavor. And so I used the excuse of creating this podcast to create what I called or what ended up being called theaveragefather.com, which was a podcast to – which was an excuse really for me to go out there and learn what it took to be a great dad. So I talked to subject matter experts, child psychologists, uh, uh, um, 
um, midwives. Uh, there, there, there's a guy wow. called the birth guy who uh, he's all about uh, – he's a guy, a midwife, so to speak, in helping people deliver their children and then help them you know, get set up to be successful once the baby came home. Uh, he was fantastic. And, and there were a number of people that we had on the show. And the, the rationale for it was to give me an excuse to interview and speak to these people so that I could learn the skill set to become better at being a father. And, of course, I shared that entire process, lessons learned and everything, with the audience that ended up following me. Now, uh, that after I actually released, I stopped doing that podcast. Um, I had a, too many other things that I was dealing with at the time, but I transitioned into creating video content. One of the biggest things that I heard, I was more comfortable on radio like we are today, uh, but mm-hmm. the video aspect was something that was very popular, drove traffic, and I was strongly encouraged by those that I knew in the, in the kind of social media space to start creating video. And so I used that excuse to tackle my next big project, which was my military transition. So in the same context, basically taking that first experiment and moving it forward, I was going to learn everything I needed to learn about military transition because, as I'm sure is the case in the U.S. military, I know it's the case in the U.S. military. I've spoken to many of you, many of you guys about this same problem. The government, the military, does not do a great job of teaching us, transitioning us, coaching us, giving us the tools to be successful on the other side. The tools do exist. It's just about getting access or being aware that those tools are there to be able to access, whether it's funding, programs, medical uh, services, whatever it be. There's a plethora of programs out there, regardless of your service, uh, that you can access that will help you be successful on the other end. And there's a number of private organizations that are willing to help as well. But the awareness of knowing that those programs are out there is the critical piece because, no offense, but... When you're dealing with an injury and your primary focus is to get better, uh, you're not focused on that piece. You're focused on, can I get up in the morning? You know, can I walk out the door without having a panic attack? Can I, uh, if you're a physical injury, can I walk down the stairs or can I do a physical task that I need to do to be able to move forward? You know, you're dealing with the recovery and the treatment of your injury, not with the specifics of your transition. And so that's, that, that, Making and highlighting those programs was, and, and learning about that was really important to me. So getting to Hired was this program, this video series, born out of my need to learn and my desire to share that information or teach everybody else about what was going on. And in Canada, my first episode was with um, – there's an organization called Canada Company that had a specific program designed to help us transition – that program was at the time being shut down and a new government program was being started up and nobody knew anything. So Ugh. I had to interview the guy who was the, the person in charge, the point of contact for what we called the Pathfinder program. And I know you guys have a Pathfinder program that's different. Uh, but in Canada, this company had what they called the Pathfinder program to help you find your path into civilian, in, into civilian space. And that was translating your military occupational skills, uh, specific trade designations, and uh, correlating those with specific skill sets, uh, skills translation courses, even vocabulary. There was all this material that they had created, and it all went in the garbage because the funding for that program dried up, and a new program was created out of thin air, and so many issues that happened at that time. It was very traumatic for a lot of folks in the Canadian military who were transitioning. And that was my first interview. And since Jeez. then, like I say, spoken to all these, these folks, specifically I spoke to um, a university professor who helped me personally with my uh, mental health situation, um, helping me map out the, uh, the process of trauma from the moment of acute injury to the, the, the process that your brain goes through or your body goes through to be able to process that trauma and come out the other side and what um, exacerbates or motivates the symptoms of PTSD or an operational stress injury as you go through. And I got to tell you, that interview helped or a specific conversation with that, that doctor, uh, you know, professor really helped me because I, one of the biggest things was like, why, how, like, what do I do? And Speaking to him was Dr. Tim Black is his name. He, he, was, he was really, really good at being able to, you know, map it out for me so I could understand 
where I go from there. And um, yeah, so what put me on my path? Uh, it started with the birth of my child, uh, my first child. I have two. And uh, it was starting down the social media path. And then my military release and the circumstances around my military release being a medical release due to injury drove me down a path where I needed to know as much as I could about the paperwork, the administration, yeah. the process, the culture shock, the support programs, and everything I needed to do to be able to be successful on the other end and share that information like I did with theaveragefather.com to be able to share that information with my veteran community, all of you, uh, to be successful on the other side as well. So that's, that's what started me down this path. Very cool, man. I think that the military does not do a great job. Well, they try, but they don't do a great job of really giving all of the information as far as admin, as far as life after military. But they also don't do a great job of looking at the member who is transitioning and seeing if there's any PTSD, if there's any, like, like we know, like, or your identity was wrapped up in your military career. When people lose their career because of what they do, they, they lost a brotherhood, they lost a support system, they lost their identity, they lost who they are. So I get get very lost in themselves and like what I do with the world. There's a well this in show the US. this show is called Life Transformation Radio, right? Mm-hmm. And when you joined the military the first time, you went through a massive transformation. But, it's funny when we think back to it, basic training is just that. It's basic. Like when you think when I think back to basic training, it was I won't say it was easy, but it wasn't like life alteringly difficult. You know, like Yes, you had some challenges, <laughs> right. you learned some new skills, maybe you got yelled at a little bit, but it was basic training. There are people, when I look back on it, I didn't think about it at the time because you were just trying to you know, get through it. You look back on it now, and there are people who never made it through basic training. Yes. They, they weren't able to complete that transformation. And what happens after you're done basic training? Well, in my case, and I'm not sure um, the training cycle for the different trades in the U.S., but... Uh, we go through different phases of training, basic being the first, and then you go to the Navy, Army, Air Force. You get your element training, then your trade training, and then you go and probably do some OJT. Yeah, and, and, and so in that entire training process and timeline, you're being indoctrinated into – and I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean like you are learning the culture, the practices, the mores of the military cultural environment, which is a very yes. unique environment. And so when you learn that and you adopt that and you have that for any length of time, I mean, for me, a decade plus, I was in just shy of 12 years. Um, you know, but think about someone coming out after 20 years or 30 years or 35 mm. or more. I mean, they are, that is all they've known. The bubble that you live in when you're in the military, not only because you're on, you know, in barracks on base or the ecosystem in which you operate for promotion and career advancement, the things that are valued, the sacrifices you made, your perspective on the world is a bubble. And the world outside of it is very different than inside the military bubble. And when you come out the other side, you again go through a life transformation because all the, the traits, the qualities, the tactics that you deployed within that cultural bubble of the military, they're not applicable immediately translatable to the civilian world you're, you're going into. In fact, right. a lot of the things that made you, that would have made you successful in a military environment perhaps will impede your success in a civilian environment. And the first thing that comes to mind about that is the way we communicate. We have a very direct form of communication within our military brotherhood, something that we all get used to and appreciate. I appreciate the brevity and the directness with which my fellow brothers and sisters in uniform communicate with me. Some of my civilian friends do not appreciate that form of communication. They find it <clears throat> a little intimidating. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> in fact, 
Uh, Eric Wright, who is uh, – I, I cannot say enough great things about Eric Wright associated with Bets to PM. Uh, he recently had a post for talking about the knife hand. I call it the uh, the Mars oh, yeah. chop. But basically we, this idea same. that we – yeah, we, we stab the space in front of us with this open palm blade. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we do, we do it in a way – it usually comes with a certain kind of tone and directness. Yeah. But we do that in a way to be able to accentuate and, and highlight things that you need to know. During a weapon safety brief, you need to understand your arcs of fire, range of weapon, range safety procedures, and so on. You yeah. know, you need to understand the words of command because if you don't, someone's going to get hurt, probably you. And no one wants to deal with that. Um, you know, yeah. uh, and that's why that that kind of comes out in, in those environments. So, you know, it <laughs> it is what it is. That's but funny. on a more on a more serious note, though, the culture shock you talk about is something that we, when you're in the bubble, <laughs> it's the 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 classic the the unknown unknowns. You don't realize when you're in the bubble how uh, distorted your perspective is, because everyone around you. And you think it's normal. So, you know, that, that is the world in which you operate. And then once you come, once the door closes on the last day of your service and you're finished that paperwork, you sign that, that last release form and you're out the door, life changes. Because uh, the way you find a job, the way you communicate, uh, the skills and terminology that are valued in a civilian workspace are different than in a military environment. And depending on your, yep. you know, your experience and your particular occupation, you might have hard right tendencies in that regard, or maybe soft left tendencies in that regard. You know, if you're if you're a frontline operator who's been dealing with death and destruction, and you know, um, specific uh, deployment of force, then you'll have a different perspective on perhaps a military. C- clerk who's been you know running your paperwork making sure that you know you have everything that you need you're getting paid on time and the food shows up when it's supposed to be there you know but we all we all have the same environment just perhaps different extremes of that that spectrum either way whether you're the clerk or the operator when you come out the other side it's going to be a culture shock and you need to be able to learn and adapt and accept the fact that you need to make this mental shift to be successful on the other end and i in doing the interviews with getting to hired, I have to say that one piece, that mental shift, that culture shock that you go through is the biggest piece of the puzzle um, that people struggle with. And it is the most critical piece to your success. If you're able to get that sorted out early on in the process, you will be much more successful going forward. Yeah. There's a stat in the U.S. military that it- if you've done over 20 years and you're retiring, your life expectancy is about five years because they either take their life or they start having a, a life crisis, start doing things out of the ordinary, driving fast or driving without a seatbelt or parasailing, hair gliding, like whatever. They start doing these dangerous activities, you know, because chasing that adrenaline, that high, you know, whatever. And I think we need to do a better job of, of what you just talked about, which was very, very well articulated. We need to address that shock that you're getting out. Like, it's going to be great for a month, but it's going to settle in, and it might not settle in the way that you want it to settle. So really, I mean, we need to really address that is you need to find something else you want to. Because people in the military, what I found out is, there's like three quarters of their A type personality. And they're go getters. And the A type personalities need something to climb on to. They need a mission. They need something to do. And uh when they're in the military, they look forward to that retirement. Some of them get jobs, some of them build businesses, and others just kind of wither away. And then we go all better and I don't know how it is in Canada, but we got a serious The, the rise of, of operational stress injuries or PTSD uh, in military environments, it's, um, I don't want to say that it's something that's new because it's certainly been around for the length mm-hmm. of military history. Um, the degree to which it's been recognized recently 
uh, or like in the past decade plus uh, is, is phenomenal. And it's because of our heightened awareness that things are kind of popping up more. Uh, whether it was shell shock before in World War I or, uh, you know, some of the trauma that people are going through to today, um, it, it, you, you don't have to be in the military to suffer from PTSD or an operational stress injury in that context. Um, you, you know, you can be a police officer, firefighter, just a casual civilian on the street. If you're involved in a tragic accident, maybe you'll end up suffering from it. But one thing that I think is important to understand um, is that the relationship that we all have as military members, when you're in uniform, uh, is a unique one. And it's, it's different from firefighters or police or paramedics, even though what they do can be and is often very dangerous. But they're in a, as a military member, you are in a unique situation. You are subject to what's referred to as unlimited liability. You are under a separate legal framework and a specific legal relationship whereby your superior officer can legally order you to put yourself in harm's way. If you think about, you know, World War I kind of vision, it's like it's going over the, going over the wall, going into the right. land. Or, you know, whatever it is. And in my case, it's like if you're, well, if you were diving and your buddy is having an emergency, you know, several tens of meters under the water, you need to go down and get him. Is that, yep. you know, when you go down there uh, and you have to bring him back up, are you fouled? Is there something going on? Is there, is there, is it a dangerous environment? What's going on? Or if you're in the battlefield and you're just trying to save your buddy or you're trying to take a, a specific tactical point, or you have to move through a dangerous zone, you know that there's IEDs on the road, you have to go through there to get to the other side because your mission objective is there and you're being ordered to do so. And that's a unique, unique environment because you don't have the legal right, depending on, as long as it's a lawful order, you don't have the legal right to say no. You have to do that. You are legally obligated to do it. And that is a unique relationship that no other occupation in the world has. And... Because of that, um, there's a social contract that exists. In some countries, it's, it's codified in law. In others, it's implied. But there is a social contract that exists that if you are going to put your health and well-being at risk for the benefit of the country, that the country will then look after you in your time of need. And um, sometimes that works out. Sometimes that doesn't, um, right. but that is a unique relationship that we have that is that makes it different than anything else that you've. And I don't want to. I don't want to in any way suggest or discredit other occupations that are dangerous. Police officers, firefighters, um, first responders are phenomenal, noble, amazing heroes the relationship they have with their occupation is just different than, than those in the military. And that's why the military stands apart yet amongst those kinds of uh, mm -hmm. special, special duties. Wonder again, I'm not there, so I don't know. I, I've never been stationed with Canadian military. I've been deployed many times. Are you somewhere where like, there's a bunch of awesome, or you know, in the Middle East where it actually rises with like the Jordanians or the Israelis like that. I don't I honestly don't know too much of what the Canadian mission is. However, comma, I do know that on the news, you don't necessarily pick a fight with it with Canada. <laughs> like you guys seem to be pretty peaceful. So, uh talk about talk about how your time in the military was, um, you know, some cool thing that it was your job, uh, some of the cool things that you saw and didn't know. And because uh, I honestly, I don't know too much of, I've never been, uh, there was one event that I went to, it was called Maple Flag. And uh, we took a bunch of F 15 over to like, uh, what's it called? Like Silver Lake, like Silver Lake, Lake or something yeah. like that. Okay, Silver Lake, yeah. It was my career, like 2002, 2004, that was 
Like, I thought that was the best thing ever because I'm from Michigan, which is technically lower Canada. You know, I've been to Canada many times as a kid. Um, mm-hmm. And it was cool to go to a lot of I've never, you know, been to play with the kids. Um, just, you know, some Aussies. I've, you know, we, we've done some exercises with Jordanians and we've been to Singapore and some places. Kind of, you know, very briefly talk about, you know, what we did in the military and, and, and some of your experience. Well, um, when it comes to multinational operations, uh, the last one that I did was in 2013. I sailed with the Dutch warship Rotterdam, which is uh, an amphibious assault oh. ship. And um, that we cool. went down the, the west coast of Africa. And from a naval perspective, I am a uh, – I'm trying to remember the exact terminology. Because my um, – so when you cross the meridian, uh, you don't beca- you're no longer a tadpole. You become a shellback of some kind, and you get this certificate. <laughs> now, mine's in Dutch, which means I can't read it. Uh, but I think I'm a golden emerald shellback. And the reason why it's called that is because you cross the meridian at the zero zero line. So, like – you know, zero latitude, zero longitude in the ocean. There's oh, a boy no, there that marks it. And uh, so cool. I think I'm an I, emerald, I, emerald golden thought, shellback or something like that. That's a cool piece of history. I didn't even know. I had no idea that they actually have a zero, zero, like that's cool. That's cool. Oh, yeah. And, they, and so from a nautical or mariner perspective, they have these different designations depending on, you know, have you crossed the Arctic Circle, the Antarctic Circle, have you crossed the International Date Line, things like that. You get these different kind of uh, things that you can call yourself. Uh, but, and it's, it's, a, um, it's a horrible process crossing the line because uh, you do these horrible, disgusting things, diving in fish guts and all these kinds of things. It's a hilarious, a lot of fun, but absolutely disgusting. Um, oh, man. And so, but during this multinational operation, uh, which was really cool. So I was an operations officer, like in an ops room dealing with, uh, Dutch, Belgian, German, U S Marines, UK Marines, Spanish Marines. Um, and we, we did, um, operations with a bunch of these African countries that were going down. There was a bunch of training ops, uh, anything from like diving, boarding party, uh, small boat operation to large exercises in Nigeria. Uh, and then, uh, basically an amphibious assault jungle warfare exercise in Cameroon. And, um, that was a lot of fun. If only because the kind of people I met, um, the it was very interesting in that environment because the while we're all military members, you know, whether you're a Marine or Navy, Army or otherwise, um, you know, we all we all had a, a very it seemed like a very similar way of being. I, I couldn't necessarily communicate very well with my Spanish <laughs> counterparts because their English wasn't very great and I have no Spanish. Um but uh, but yeah, every everybody was um, it was very interesting and seeing the different cultural cultural relationships. Like when when you're on a uh, Canadian naval warship, things are pretty pusser. And if you're in the navy, you know what that means. Like things are strict, and there is okay. a, a we'll call it a class structure that that exists. You know, <laughs> uh, there's a hierarchy, a very clear hierarchy that exists, and a way that you refer to people. It's like sir, ma'am, you know, master, master corps, or um. Master seaman, petty officer, like you, you address yeah. people in that professional military environment. In the uh, in the Dutch warship, it was much more cash. Uh, things they were they were very not loosey goosey, but they were much more chummy about everything, and that worked out just fine. It was a great working environment, but it was just not what I was used to. And what was interesting about that scenario was during the one emergency that I had. So when you're on watch in a Navy, uh, in a Navy environment, you know, you've got a, a period of time you're on watch. Uh, and whenever the turnover comes, it's always, always then that the bad shit happens. Um, and so I'm, yep. it's seven o'clock in the morning and I'm getting ready for my turnover. It's a weird timing, but it's seven o'clock. Uh, so I'm getting ready to do my turnover with my Dutch counterpart and um, he's come in, he's got his coffee in hand. It's like, it's been a long night. As far as like nothing has happened, it's been very boring. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to getting off watch and just like, you know, eating some food and going to bed. And um, I'm in the middle of talking to him. And it was funny. His name's Captain, Captain Lex, and his birthday was the same as mine. He's like, he was, I think he was like 15 years older than me, but we had the same birthday. It was very strange. Um, 
And uh, anyway, so we're, we're talking, and all of a sudden, the communicator, who is my communication liaison with the amphibious assault force um, uh, ashore, calls out a nine-liner. And oh. I thought he was joking. I was like, what? And luckily, because this was turnover, all the senior people were in the room, which was great. Uh, so I had the senior uh, sergeant major, who was the the sergeant major in charge of all comms. He was on that corporal, like, you know, fly on stink. And he was confirming, like, he, he just confirmed that it was a nine-liner. And it was so interesting to watch because in the span of about 15 to 30 seconds, the heat and energy in the room went from being, like, super chill to your hair's on fire. And yeah. I, I don't know, again, I, I'd never seen these guys operate in an, in an actual like emergency exercise or like anything where the, you know, the stuff hits the fan. But I was, I was kind of shocked because people's voices went up. People started getting a little flaily and panicky. And I had, I had to like, I, I, I kind of, it was weird because I'm the only Canadian there. I'm used to things happening a certain way, and this is not the way we do business. Like in a, in the Canadian warship, you get your shit together and you dial it, like you you button that down and you get it done. Not this whatever the hell is happening in this kitchen fire. This is not the way we do business. And so I the the guy beside me is is losing it, and I and I raise my voice to get everybody's attention. I was like, everybody calm down. And then I, everyone shut up. And I, and it was weird because I've got like a, a Lieutenant Colonel, a Lieutenant Commander, three other Lieutenant Commanders and Majors in the room. And they're all like, they were all the ones chattering and I'm the Navy Lieutenant, you know, (laughs) exercising command over these guys, which is something I've done before as as an officer of the watch, you do that, but it was weird. So anyways, I raised my voice, tell everybody to shut the fuck up. And, um, and I, I start doing the judo chop and directing people to do what they need to do. So I point to the sergeant major and I say, confirm the nine liner, get the details to me once the message is complete. I per- turn to the, the, uh, the, the light colonel and the major, sorry, lieutenant commander where the, uh, the medical officers there. And I said, yep. I want you to prep your uh, medical room and be prepared to receive casualties. I pointed to the amphibious assault commander he was a he was a major i said major i want you to get your uh, people ready and i want timelines to be able to launch the amphibious assault craft uh and i and i uh reached over to he was actually my um uh social media he's like a, a pafo or public affairs officer for lack of a better way yep, to describe it yep. but he was the only he was the only dutch navy guy in the room and i pointed to him and i said i want you to contact the uh it was a U.S. Marine air debt that was on board. So I want you to contract the flight deck and get that, uh, get the Marine Air Force CO up here now. And stuff started moving. And then things kind of fell in line and it was, it was fine, but it was just really weird to me at that time. Everybody's hair went on fire and then we had to dial back in. Now I've seen that happen in other environments, but I, it was just weird. And it was strange because like I say, there was all these, these different people from different countries and, and we hadn't, we hadn't practiced it. We usually you go through some kind of, uh, exercise or, or some kind of practice in advance of the emergency so you all know your roles, you know how you're going to do things. And that had never happened, at least not while I was on board. And so when the emergency came in, it was, well, someone's got to step up. And nobody around me was stepping up. I was in the midst of my turnover. Technically, it was still my ops room. So I stood up and I took it because, I mean, that's what you got to do. Uh, and it was just enough. interesting. To, it was interesting oh. to go through that scenario, um, but that is my only, like, true multinational operation. Other stuff that I've done, whether it's rim pack in the you know in and around Hawaii or uh, sailing on a TGX on the East Coast, they've involved U.S. ships and they've involved like you know other other players, but no one actually on board. I had a I had a um, uh, a U.S. major as uh, or sorry U.S. lieutenant commander as the uh, uh, com- or the task force, task force OPSO, he was basically the liaison for the Commodore on board who was in charge of the task group. And uh, he was the only U.S. serviceman I'd ever kind of interacted with on board uh, my ship at that time. But on that, it was all just like communicating to different ships via radio uh, or whatever signal and uh, and moving forward from there. Wow. Very cool. 
Uh, who knew what kind of our service kind of ROEs up? But when you guys have the Canadian Navy, Dutch, and you know, all like US there too, is there a structure or is there a hand structure or a hockey of some kind that's like, okay, Canadians, then it's the Dutch, then it's the US, the US has it, then it's the Dutch, it, like, it, or is everybody kind of just doing their own thing? He kind of falls in line with, I mean, do you guys follow behind the Dutch or like, do you know how that works? Uh, so usually in a task force scenario, if I so I apologize, uh, Sean's a little broken in my ears in my headset. So I, I think I'm understanding the question being that you're asking what the ROE is or the chain of command when it comes to multinational operations and dealing with uh, ships from different nations. Yeah. So normally in that in that environment you have a CTG, so the task group commander, com- commander task group. Um, yep. And if they are tasked out to smaller units, you have either uh, an officer or the OIC, officer in command, uh, officer in command of operational movement, tactical movement, and so on. They designate it or they delineate it down into different aspects of control. And, um, and so generally speaking, there is a very clear rank structure or a chain of command when it comes to multinational task groups. There is the task group commander and they will designate as required to other subcommanders to be able to command different areas of warfare, the surface warfare, the underwater warfare piece, and so on. And they will, uh, if they're operating off of uh, whatever their command platform may be, aircraft carrier, for example, in the United States, or maybe a, a cruiser or a destroyer with a command platform suite in it, um, they will designate different aspects of the warfare game to different area commanders, above water warfare commander, a, a below water warfare commander, uh, air superiority or air defense um, commander, various other things. Um, and so they'll designate those different um, responsibilities. Those commanders will then report to either the CTG or uh, someone in his chain, direct chain, um, and then decisions will be made. But all, all national uh, COs, so for example, if there's a Canadian, American, and a Dutch, all those COs are in command of their own ships, and they have task group or um, uh, kind of like allied ROE, and then they have their national ROE. And so uh, sometimes, for example, you talked about like don't mess with the Canadians. Uh, and what was interesting about that in the Afghanistan context is that different nations in Afghanistan had ROE that restricted them from operating in certain areas or doing certain kinds of jobs that might have been or not been dangerous. In that context, the Canadians had ROE that allowed them to do all the, all the dirty business, and they did it well. And so when you talk to any of the Americans that were over there at the time, they'll know that the Canadians, when deployed uh, in, a, in various operational areas, uh, were kicking ass and taking names. Because yeah, they had the ROE that. to do so. I had, uh, I was an issue with a guy and he was raving about the the Canadian army. Was like, no joke. I was like, What? He's like, dude, nobody's invading Canada. <laughs> nobody's like nobody's warring with Canada. He, he's like, Man, I had an issue with a couple of those guys. Do handle business. And I would hate or it's almost like we a harbor, you know, Japan. They said we've awoken a sleeping giant. And they're like, I would love to see what happens if someone's like, Canada's timid. Let's go see what Quebec has. Somebody packs them and watch Canada just swallow them. <laughs> like, right? Like, let's just see what Canada has to offer, you know. And so, uh, but you know, it's not like Kim is like. Nobody's doing that. Always like everybody. <laughs> one of the things about Everybody Canadians. One of the things about Canadians that, um, if you look at them historically, is that um, Canadians are not a, or Canada has not traditionally been a strong, like uh, is not has not been a military superpower. Right. But any any of the global conflicts that Canada has been called to, really since you know World War One. Anytime we get involved, 
we do extremely well. Extremely and what well. that what what that's about is for lack of a better way to describe it is the work ethic. We may not have uh the aircraft carriers or the nuclear weapons or the you know the massive amounts of tanks and hardware to invade other countries. That's not our operational goal. We go in like a special operations team does. You have a highly trained small group of highly effective individuals deployed for a short period of time or a specific period of time to accomplish a specific goal. They go in, they destroy the opposition, they accomplish their goal, and they get out. And that's traditionally how Canada has operated in its conflicts, in that they are highly trained, extremely competent at what they do. They go in as either part of a coalition force or uh, deployed independently. They go in, conduct the operation they're there to do, they get it done, and they get out. Um, you know, politics aside about how you get tied up in various, in various you know, conflicts and so on, you know, we won't talk about that here today, but when it comes to getting the business done, Canadians historically have been highly professional, go in there and get her done. Absolutely. I'd agree with that. Absolutely. So how do you elevate the world around you? What is it that people come to you for? How do you work with your parents? Um, you know, and, and, and how do you, what do you do getting to hard and know that you do everything? Why is that so important? I had an interesting conversation today, actually. Uh, Somebody reached out to me on LinkedIn, and uh, I had seen that this person was starting a podcast uh, with the the U.S. Army, and it was was designed to help military members and veterans uh, in their transition. I thought it was a great idea. And so I reached out to that individual and I said, uh, you know, how can I help? And I got the most flattering response. I, she said, is this the Tony Morrow asking to help me? Hell yes. And I thought that was hilarious um, because it was not what I was expecting. Um, and to be honest, when I create getting to hired, like I create the video content. Again, keep in mind. It's from a context of I'm creating it to be able to learn more myself and then share that information and have impact on our community, the veteran community, and the mil- you know, folks in the military and the veteran community. Um, that's my intent. And I don't have a good sense of how far that penetrates or um, how much it's affecting people's lives until I have interactions like this. And... <laughs> I, I thought it was amazing. So Robin Johnson is her name, and she is, uh, you know, driving this, this podcast called the Soldier for Life podcast, the U.S. Army Soldier for Life podcast. And it's brand new. Um, first episode came out earlier this week, and she is driving this, this piece of, of valuable content for it. And, and, and it's for, you know, the U.S. US Army military members yep. trying to transition. And... I think that's that's huge, and and the fact that someone like her, who is you know a senior leader, uh, driving a project like this forward in a different country. I mean, granted, Canada and U.S. You, you know we're yeah. close, but yeah. I mean, she's in a different country and she knows who I am, and I thought that that was incredibly flattering. Um, and it's different too. It's not the same. Like, I mean, it's completely service, a different job. Like, that's super cool. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, how, how is that impacting the world around you? Well, my whole, my whole intent, not only to be able to learn for myself, but be able to help others in their ability to transition, to be successful from a military career into a civilian career, um, you know, am I having impact doing that? That one interaction today uh, and that conversation that I had with Robin was fantastic. I know that based on that conversation, more good stuff, more good work, more impact is going to happen. And um, I think, I, I think it, it's a, whether, whether or not my individual content is having the impact, the fact that I'm able to influence, support, and help other content like that be created and help you know, 
however many thousands or hundred thousands of military members and veterans, that is fantastic to me. And also, um, I, I mentioned Eric Wright earlier in the show. Eric Wright has a program or a company called Vets to PM and has a program around helping veterans and military members get their project management designation. I interviewed him two years ago, well, a year and a half ago, about getting that designation for myself. And oh. since then, I didn't know anything about project management other than, you know, I did it in my MBA, but I, I didn't realize that there was a separate designation, a PMP, that you can get from an organization called PMI, the Project Management Institute, about you know, being certified as a professional designation for this, this thing. And so I didn't realize it was there. I don't, I know that a couple of engineers in the Canadian Navy have it, but I didn't know how it may or may not apply to this Navy warfare officer type. And I found out about it, got educated about it, working towards it. And now I'm going to hopefully get to a point that I can work with vets to PM to bring those programs across Canada to make, make it available for military members across all the bases across Canada so that we can, you know, we can translate those skills. Cause if you're, if you're a person in uniform and you've done anything from a small party task to operational planning process, terminology might be a little different in the U S but just basically if you, if you, if you, if you know, if you know, SMESC format, that's a NATO standard. Uh, if you, if you know SMESC <laughs> format, you've done projects of that's some all. type. And so if you know, if you know SMESC format, you need to look into project management, vets to PM, and figure out how you can translate your military skill and experience into a civilian designation that will only help you, A, professionally develop within the military, or B, help you get out of the military when you're doing your transition. And I would never have known about that had it not been for this show. I would not have been able to share that information with the people that I've shared it with, my friends and colleagues in and around where I live in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, as well as people across the country. And, you know, what kind of impact is it having on the world around you? I'm having people from, you know, the United States uh, contact me and tell me how I, they would love my help in their podcast. I'm having impact on my immediate community about helping them become more mobile in the workforce and had be more successful in their civilian career. I, I, I think that ha the, the decision to, to start doing this show, getting to hire, to start interviewing those people, to start sharing that message and sharing those lessons learned, it's having a rewarding impact on my life, but really it allows me to help others. And Hey, if you, if it's helped you, if you've ever watched my show, and you are getting value out of it, send me a message. Let me know. Get me on Instagram. Get me on Twitter. Send me a, a word to let me know that it's having impact because, or fire me up on LinkedIn. I, I can't, like, I was, I was very flattered by the comments that Robin shared with me and that a person of her um, substantial accomplishment would think that way about the content that I'm creating because like I say, I'm, I'm creating it for our community, but I don't really get a sense of how much it is getting appreciated until I have conversations like that. Love it. Love to hear that stuff. Absolutely super on point, man, because I, I, I feel the same way. I got I actually got recognized in an airport, and that was, that was super cool. Are you – Life information radio. I'm like, oh my god, I listen to your show. That's, <laughs> like, that's so cool. Super cool. The next time, who is that? This is amazing. I'm like, wow, that was the coolest thing ever. I got recognized in an airport. <laughs> like, that was super cool. So, yeah, man, you really never know uh, the impact that you're making until those moments come. And, uh, and we're just glad that we did. Uh, we need to close the show, so here's what to do. We're going to do a shameless plug. You can plug your websites, programs, products, services, however you want people to hold you, uh, whatever you want the audience to know and to do, shamelessly plug, go. So my name is Tony Morrow, and I produce a show called Getting 
to hired. If you're a military member who is in uniform and thinking about getting out, or you're in the midst of transition, then you need to go to YouTube at getting the number two hired, because the video content there is going to help you either be aware or find out the information that you need to be successful in your transition. And if that is the case, and you're thinking about getting out of the military, or you're in the midst of that journey right now, I want you to get on LinkedIn and reach out and connect with me. Tony, as in to New York, Morrow, tomorrow, T-O-N-Y-M-O-R-R-O-W. Find me on LinkedIn. You will be able to see my content, not only that, but you're going to be able to connect with me. And we are going to work together about how getting your LinkedIn profile up and running is one of the first steps that you're going to have to take to become successful in your civilian career. Love it. Dude, super cool to talk to you. Different country, different branch of service. I'm Air Force, you're Navy. Um, but you know what? Still serving the same mission. So uh, super cool that, uh, you know, that we have time to chat and talk and really get the message out there that there are people that care. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of suicides here in, uh, in active duty in veterans and, and you know, especially at like VAs, you know, here in the United States, I don't know what is happening. We need to fix it. We need to do something. And, uh, and I appreciate the fact that you're on the line with a new mission. Try to fix it. One thing about our community, if you feel when you leave the military that you've lost that community, one thing to remember is that you're always going to be a veteran. So all of us who identify as veterans, we are probably going through or have gone through something very similar. And we are there and we are here to be able to support you. So don't feel that just because you've put your uniform aside that somehow you're abandoned or isolated or float with, you know, no land to see. You know, we are, we are all around you. All you need to do is, take, is, is do the crazy step of sticking your hand up and saying, I need help. And there's veterans all around you virtually in social media, physically in your community, who will come out and be able to support and help you in whatever it is that you need. Perfect. But Tony, thank you so much for coming on the show and, and you know, talking to us about transition, your career, and uh, I wish you the best, my friend. John, thank you so much for having me on the show, and uh, I look forward to doing it again sometime in the future. Awesome. Like there's an amazing guest impacting the world around him, literally the world around him. And if anything resonated with you, you are a military veteran. Please reach out on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and check out what he's doing for the veteran community and join along with him in his new mission. And with that, I close the door. Live your brand and opportunities every day to live the core values that you hold deep in your heart. And I can live your brand. So, until next episode.